Good morning, First Church. Why don't you guys stand up? Before we get into worship this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that we could all be here together, Lord, to worship you. Lord, you are the reason that we're here today. And so we give you the glory and the honor, Lord, and the praise. Lord, we ask that just as we're here, Lord, that we would put everything else that's going on in our lives, Lord, just on pause right now, Lord, and just focus on you with everything we have. Lord, we love you so much. We're so thankful for who you are, for your love and your mercy and your grace, Lord. And so this morning we give it all to you, God. We worship you in spirit and in truth. Let your name be glorified. Amen. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. And everything around me shaking. I'm never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. Yeah, I'm gonna 
You may be seated. I want to welcome you this morning to First Church. We are glad you're here with us to worship with us in obedience to the Lord. I know we say this all the time, but it's such a profound thought if you think about it. This morning is not about you. It's not about you. And it, that is really hard for us because we tend to frame everything in our lives 
about how it affects us. How do I feel about that? What do I think about that? And this morning, what we want you to do is try to break out of that and think, it's not about me. We tend to look at things and go, well, I want to learn something today, or I'd like to get a good feeling today, or I'd like to see this, or I'd like to see that. And what have we done? We've automatically framed it in, it's all about me. So it's not about learning something today. It's not about getting a good feeling today. It's not about that. It's about honoring and glorifying God. That's what we're doing this morning. We're getting outward focused. That's what we want to do because inward focus, ultimately our culture says this is the way to live and it kills you. It kills you. He says, I want you to be outward focused. So today's just a little bit of it. This morning is not about you. You might learn something, awesome. You might get a good feeling, that's great. But that's not the purpose. And the thing is then we take that and we carry that into the rest of our lives. We suddenly start going at work. This is not just about me. When we're in our homes, it's not just about me. When we go out, it's not just about me. When we meet our neighbors, it's not just about me. We get outward focused. And that's when lives change. And that's when your heart changes. And you begin to see the joy that God brings in service. Okay, this is turning into a sermon. I'm sorry. This is supposed to just be kind of like a little welcome, but I blab. Yes, okay. So this morning, think about that as we worship, continue to worship, as we study God's word, as we go to prayer together, in everything we do, start trying to get that mindset that is so hard for us. It's not about me. So now, as we continue, thinking about what we're singing about, what do the words mean? What do those words mean in terms of God and my relationship with him? And we start focusing on him instead of ourselves. As we continue to worship, if you'd like to remain seated in worship, fine. If you'd like to stand while you worship, that's fine. We just want you to worship and honor God together with us. Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me the night is dark but I am not forsaken
with every breath i long to follow jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and There's a grace when your heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminded of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears that burden, where another died for me. There is another in the fire. It left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Well, either way, I won't bow to the things of this because I know.
There is no other name than the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come with me in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. be seated. As we continue, we're going to take a short break and rearrange the stage and you can grab another cup of coffee. But before we do that, um, we have these visitor cards. They're in the seat back in front of you. If this is your first time or you've never done it before, we'd love to have you fill that out. There's a little basket in the back. You put it in the basket and I just, I promise you this. All we do is send you a letter. We put a little gift card for a cup of coffee in there and that's it. We are not going to hassle you or hound you or put you on our, any kind of a mailing list that will just fill up your phone or whatever. This is just something we would appreciate if you do. And I, and I always say this, and you know what? If you don't wanna do it, it's fine. That's fine too, all right? So we're gonna take a short break and then we'll call you right back. Let's do that right now, thank you. Um, I wanna talk about Abraham and Sarah today. We uh, are in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and we're in Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, we're uh, just studying how God works. The book of Hebrews is such a beautiful book. This is how God works. This is how faith works, and it's all about Jesus, Je and the whole theme. You remember the theme of this book? Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the, than the old way of the sacrifices. Jesus is better than the old covenant. He just, he's just hammering this to these Jewish Christians and, and also Hebrews who maybe don't believe. He's hammering this. And now he's starting to get into, because he's been talking about this, he understands that one of the things that can happen is people start going, okay, you know, you've talked about having faith in Christ. How does that work? How do you define that? How, do you, how does that work out in the life of a person? How do, how do I have faith? How much faith do I need to have? How does it grow? How does it not grow? How is it stifled? All of these things. He's talking about these things, and, and we're deep in it right now. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, I'm going to read you verses 8 through 12 of Hebrews chapter 11. You can follow along in your Bible on your phone or just listen as I read, okay? By faith. Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, 
became descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. So by faith, it starts it off. And this, this chapter is just over and over, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And we learned in the past two weeks, we've learned, first of all, we started to grapple with what is this concept of faith. We understood that it's three things. It's reasoning, it's conviction, it's commitment. That is it is reasoning. It is using your mind to evaluate data and facts. It's not a blind leap of faith, right? It's not this, this, this just totally blind, I know this isn't true, but I'm going to believe it anyways. That's not what it is. It's reasoning. And then there's a conviction. And what does that mean? It means you go, I believe this. I believe this. And then it has to go to the next step, commitment. And commitment is on the basis of this, I now live this way. I change this, or I change this, or I work at the, and, and, and commitment happens. And you know, we talked about that. I know we talked about that. Like, how are you gonna choose a surgeon? What do you do? You don't just close your eyes and just pick something out of, on, you, know, you, you, you investigate, you ask people. Have you had surgery with this guy before? How'd it go for you? You ask people like that. And then after a while, you decide, okay, this is the surgeon I'll take. This is the person I will allow to do this operation on my body. And then there's, that's the conviction. You say, this is the one. And then there's commitment, right? That's when you're on the gurney and you're being wheeled into the silver room. Then you're committed. There's no going back. And see, in commitment, faith flourishes and grows. Commitment proves the faith. So faith starts with reasoning. In verse 3 of Hebrews 11, he talks about this. We believe in a... We believe the visible world came from a super, supernatural being, that the invisible made the visible. The physical universe that we see, in my opinion, does not explain itself very well. If you get rid of the premise that there's a creator, there are many things that become unexplainable. The Christian faith is a reasoning. But it's more than that because the gospel is more than an idea to think about. Last week we looked at this. The gospel is a power. The Bible makes this clear, the power of salvation. Romans chapter 1 talks about this. He says, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power. It is the power. There's power. It is power in the form of ideas that has been written down for us. So on one hand, it has content that needs to be understood. That's what we're doing this morning. We're working on Hebrews chapter 11 on content concerning Abraham and Sarah that needs to be understood. But it also has to be submitted to because it is a power. It is a living thing. The gospel bears fruit. It grows. So if the gospel is going to be a power in your life, you have to allow it. You have to trust it. You have to start to live it. And I said last week, it's not just believing in God. It is believing God. That is the key. There's a huge difference. So as we continue in, to investigate, what is a life of faith? How does it work? The author in Hebrews is giving us now example after example after example to flesh out this idea. Faith is such a many faceted thing. It has so many aspects to it. And he's giving us all these different aspects. And today it's Abraham. He's telling us a little bit about Abraham. He's an important figure. The Jews call him father. Why? You know, Father Abraham, right? Father Abraham, many sons, blah, blah, blah. He's the father of their faith. That's what they think. That's how they look at him. And we can see he is pivotal in God's unfolding plan to reach the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. So let me just do this. Let me read you a little bit, a short bit, kind of condensed, of Genesis 12, which is the background for what he's going to talk about. Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I show you. I love, if you, if you have a King James Version, I love the King James Version in that point because it says, God said, get out. I love that. It's kind of like God said, Abraham, boot, there you go. Keep running, that's it, All right? He says, you're, you're gonna go to the land I'll show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went. He got out, as the Lord had told him. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all their possessions they had accumulated, and he set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So Abram went. This is, this is the background. So 
When we look at Hebrews 11, I want you to see the first thing, faith that is willing. What we want is a faith that is willing, one, to go. This is what Abraham has. God gave Abraham actually multiple calls in his life, each one pushing him, stretching him a little bit. First, he said, leave your land, leave your family, leave your culture, leave, oof, leave your comforts, get out. Second, he says, I will give you a land. This is the next part of it. I'm gonna give you a land, but Abraham never owned land. He never owned land. It was an inheritance that was coming and he lived in light of it. Third, I will give you a son. Fourth, and this is the hard one, we'll address this next week, give me your son. Trust me on this. So the story of Abraham's life is God said, get out. Abraham said, where? Uh, and God said, I'll tell you later. Then God said, I'll give you this land. And Abraham said, how? And God said, I'll tell you later. Then God said, I'll give you a son. And Abraham said, when? And God said, I'll tell you later. And God said, give me your son. And Abraham said, why? And God said, I'll tell you later. So we have this example of this man. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. So he has this faith that says, I will go. I will go. Now, this could be important for us. You might say, I don't hear voices like that. I don't hear voices like, well, not very often anyways. I don't hear voices like that. So what is the call of God in our life? This is the call of God in his life. What's the call of God in our life? The call of God is anything that shakes you, anything that makes you think about your life and what's going on, anything that gets you awake and recognize, what am I doing? People oftentimes go through life thinking, not even thinking about that, not really ever grappling. Um, wow, I'm dating myself. Pink Floyd <laughs> calls this being comfortably numb. Comfortably numb. And that's where a lot of people are at. And the call of God is when it shakes us out of our comfortableness, out of our numbness, where it rocks our boat, because people often just do whatever our culture tells them is the key to life, the good life, the American dream, right? And God steps in and he challenges that. The call of God can come in a lot of ways. It can come through a tragedy. It can come through a friend. It can come through a good book. It can come through a song. It can come through all sorts of things. Okay, just so you don't think that I'm a total dinosaur with uh, mentioning Pink Floyd. Let me mention somebody more, more recent who's pretty popular, M. Behold, and I think that's how you pronounce her name. She has a song called Numb Little Bug. And it is a really, it's a good song. I mean, it's well done. She has a good voice. I love the songs, catchy, whatever. But I don't know if she wrote it or someone else wrote it, but someone received the call of God when they wrote this song. They got shook. Their life was just wrecked. Listen to these lyrics. I just want to see if you feel the same as me. Do you ever get tired, a little bit tired of life? Like you're not really happy, but you don't want to die. Like you're hanging by a thread, but you got to survive. Because we have to survive. And she asked a little later, am I past repair? I'm a little bit tired of trying to care when I don't. I'm a little bit tired of quick repairs just to cope. I'm a little bit tired of sinking. There's water in my boat. I'm barely breathing. I'm trying to stay afloat. So I get these quick repairs to cope. I guess I'm just broken and broke. There's someone whose life has been shook, right? Suddenly waking up and seeing, and a little later she talks about, I've got a prescription now. I really hope this solves the problem, right? This life has been shook and looking for answers, I'm looking for answers. I pray for M. Behold every day. It's just stuck in my head. I can't get out of my head. And so I just pray for her because 
she's been shook. She's been shook. And I, and I, and I want to tell you, this is what happens. It comes through all kinds of different things. And it might be even just listening to a song, reading a book. It's when God makes you ask, what am I doing here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Does this really matter? What does it all mean? Because understand something. Abraham had a life, right, before the call of God. And he seems by all accounts to be a very rich person. He had a good life. He had a comfortable life. He had a lot of possessions. He had a lot of stuff. And the call of God came. And God calls him to a new life. He calls him to a place where he would later receive an inheritance that, he, that he's not going to receive in his lifetime. And so we have this idea now. The writer of Hebrews is beginning to teach us something. This idea of living for more than the here and now. God called Abraham to change the foundations of his life, to look for new foundations. And this gets at us because this gets at the need to control. And we are all wanting to control our life. We control our lives so we can feel comfortable. We control our lives so we can have a sense of security, that things are working the way they're supposed to work. And this is what I think should happen. And I am gonna do everything I can to make it happen that way. And we, we have this drive. And I'm going to tell you, security is a myth. You never know what will happen tomorrow. You never know what will happen tomorrow. Abraham did not need all the answers and all the information to obey. And that's our problem sometimes, right? We want all the info before we obey. And, and, and that's a sign of what? That's a sign of wanting to be in charge. If I want all the info before I decide to obey, that means I evaluate the info and make the decision on obedience. So who's in charge there? Me. Me. It's like when my kids were younger, every once in a while, not too long, but every once in a while, I would just do something that was just a total surprise. So one time I told the kids, I said, look, Everybody, let's go. We're going to head out. We're going we're to go do something. It's going to be a total surprise. It's just, it's, but it's going to be great, you guys, okay? So get, get ready. Let's go out in the car and let's go. And it's interesting how my kids reacted, right? One of my kids, not going to name him, but he's my oldest. <laughs> I hope he's not watching. Hi, Derek. Um, I named him. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and his reaction kind of goes along this line. Well, what are we doing? I'm not telling. It's going, to be, it's going to be great. So let's go. Well, I don't know if I want to do it. I got to know if it's going to be that much fun. I, I need to know ahead of time. I need the details so I can evaluate. Is this a planned outing, Dad? Because you're not so good at planning things. Because I like a plan. And another one of my daughters would say something like, I think I might have something better to do. I want to stay home safe and sound. I want to read a book. <laughs> She's here. <laughs> as soon as I said, read a book. Okay, sorry. Um, not always that way. Not always that way. Another one of my kids would say, Dad, you got to tell me because I don't know what to wear. You have to tell me exactly what we're doing so I can dress appropriately and not look like a sloppy mess. And I don't want to be embarrassed. And Dad, can I tell you what to wear also? And I would say, trust me, I have, I, I have your best interests in mind. And my youngest son, Cody, and my youngest daughter, Addie, they would always go, great, let's go. That's why they're my favorites. <laughs> I think that's the that's thing there. Um, I'm just kidding, not really. Um, the call of God, the call of God shows, it shows us something is that nothing in this world has a foundation. Nothing in this world lasts. And this is how you become courageous. This is how we learn to take risks. When we begin to realize nothing lasts, nothing has a foundation, only God, only God, and the inheritance that he has promised us that we will receive as heirs of the king of the universe. And then we can become courageous. Then we can take risks. 
whether it's little risks or big risks. Because you know what? For some of us, what are little risks to other people? They're big risks. For some of us, coming to church is uh, just, it's natural, it's fine. And for some people, coming into a room like this with this many people is just, it's like a panic attack. So the hardest thing that that person might do this week is go to church. So risks are kind of, it, it varies with each person, right? And so this is how we learn to be courageous. This is how we learn to take risks because none of this lasts. Only what is done for Christ is what lasts. Years ago, when I started this, um, this ministry of going to Arizona and uh, ministering to the Navajos, whatever it was, 28 years ago, something like that, um, it was interesting, um, about our second or third year, when we were still figuring out what we were doing and still struggling and still trying to make stuff work and dealing with all the issues and uh, of uh, just communicating cross-culturally and working with people. And um, so we were, at, we were in the middle of the desert, okay? It's the middle of the desert. And there's just a few little buildings. And then you see way over there. There's a house over there. And then way over there, there's a house over there. And we're crowded by Navajo standards, you know? And so we're in the middle of nowhere and two motorcycles come riding by. And they, and they ride by and they slow down and turn around and then they come back and they pull up into this dusty area where we're at uh, with like 70 or 80 kids running around in our team, you know? And they get off and they come over and they say, what is going on here? And I said, we're having an outreach for, for Navajos, you know, here, we're gonna, like we come for like 11 days. And the, one of the guys said, well, I'm with the Christian Motorcycle Association, and this is the coolest thing I've seen. I mean, I, this is the only thing I've seen for the last two hours. You know, we've been riding in the desert. And I said, oh, cool. Man, that's awesome. You know, we said a few things. And they said, well, we're going to head off. We're going to meet some other people. I said, oh, that's, that's great. And the guy turned around and he says, wait, let me pray. And I said, sure. And he said, God, I just pray. You know, he prayed for the ministry that hearts would be open and receptive that, you know. And one of the things he prayed, because it caught, he says, and I pray that they just, just keep coming back for these kids. And we kept coming back for 20, 30 years. And, and uh, that was my first introduction to the Christian Motorcycle Association, because I will be honest with you, when they pulled up with their leathers, I can't really see what's on them. I'm a little nervous. I said even to one of the adults, if we got to get the kids inside quick, be ready. Because I don't know who these guys are, right? And, and, and they blessed us. They blessed us. So that's my plug. Just It popped in my head because that's exactly what happened. All right. So faith is what? Faith is willing to go and then willing to forego. That is, willing to go is this idea that he heard and he obeyed God. Willing to forego means this. It means, that means giving up control. And giving up control sometimes means sacrifices. We have to understand that. This is what I love about the word of God. It does not sugarcoat the concept of being a follower of Jesus Christ into pie in the sky, by and by, everything's happy, happy, joy, joy. It doesn't do that. It tells us right up front. There's times where this may be difficult. All right, so verse nine. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Isn't that interesting? You know, Abraham had permanency in, at, at his home back in Ur. He had a place. He was rich. He was probably respected. You know, he's probably doing really well. And now he lives in a tent his whole rest of his life. God says, I got this huge land for you. It's going to be your inheritance. And he's like, well, that sounds, you know, I don't know what he thought. And he goes, and he goes. And so he begins to realize, I'm living in a tent the whole time. I don't own any of this land. He never owned any of the land God promised him. He bought one small plot to bury his wife. That's all he owned. He never owned the land. Giving up control can involve sacrifices. Living in a tent is the definition of not being permanent. 
You know, in Mark chapter 10, Peter said to Jesus, Jesus, we gave everything up for you. Jesus talked about whatever, sacrifice, things like that. And he goes, we gave everything up for you. And Jesus tells him, look, people who give up, whatever it is, he says, they're going to gain a hundredfold. It's a matter of priorities. It's what becomes important to you. And so, following the call of God made him a stranger in a strange land which is also a good book, but that's a whole other thing. Following the call of God made him a stranger in the land he was called to. And that's something that is important for us in terms of application. The Bible is very clear. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's our first priority. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are pilgrims. It frames it that way a number of times. We are pilgrims. What is a pilgrim? A pilgrim is somebody who's on a journey, and they happen to be in this place at this time, but this is not their final destination. They're on a journey to their final destination. And he says, we are pilgrims. We are like Abraham. And the problem is, we start to try to just become comfortable. And mm, There's nothing wrong with being comfortable, unless that's your goal in life then that becomes a problem. There's nothing wrong. But what happens? We tend to, to, to blend in. We tend to become what our culture tells us we should become. We take our instructions from, instructions from outside of us and allow them to tell us what, what's best for us. And God says, none of that stuff will last. It's all a load of crap. Don't, don't go for it. Don't go for it. We put our trust in the wrong things. We forget This is something I like to talk about sometimes, but we forget every generation of people in the history of the world think they're the ones that have it together. Every generation thinks that they're the ones that have it together. Think back 100 years ago, how people thought society should be structured. They were wrong. Think about what people thought was fashionable or attractive. They were wrong. Whatever, a lot of things. In fact, we look back and we kind of laugh. I mean, think about it. Early 1920s, what happened? They had just finished World War I, the war to end all wars. And one of the big cries was, we finished war. It's done. Utopia. We're on the precipice of utopia. With ed- the right education, we will hit this time of peace. No more war. Isn't that great? They're saying no more war as Hitler is gaining power in Germany. That's so stupid. And it's not stupid like they're stupid people. It's stupid to think that this generation has got it all together. I look back, some, we, were going through, we were going through pictures a while back, and there were some pictures of me when I was in high school. And I was like, that guy's a jerk. I would not like him at all if I was back in high school because he's a weirdo. Right? Look how he dressed. Oh, he wore a Nehru jacket to school like it was cool. What a joke. If you don't know what a Nehru jacket is, just look it up. Just look it up. You will laugh with me. They thought war was over. They thought education would cure the ills of society. They thought they were on the cusp of utopia. They were wrong. Think back 50 years ago. 50 years ago. What? I think back 50 years ago, what I thought was cool and important. (laughs) Silly. So are we so ignorant as to think that now we have it figured out? Finally, we got it because it's natural. We tend to think that we finally, I'm right now. I was wrong a lot when I was a kid. I was wrong a lot as I was growing up. I was wrong a lot on how to parent. I was wrong a lot on how to be a good husband. I was wrong a lot on a lot of things, but now I got it. Now I've got it. Subtly, we tend to think that. And let me tell you something. You, all, everybody, <laughs> you, everybody who's below 30 here, In a while, right, your grandkids are going to think that you were the dumbest people who ever lived the earth. Your grandkids are going to see pictures of you, the way you dress right now, and they're going to go, oh, my goodness, that, what were you thinking? And they're going to think about things that you thought was important, and they're going to say, you're so stupid. You know, they won't say it to you. Grandkids are better that way. They're kind of nice. But inside, they're going dinosaur dinosaur 
My wife listens to a podcast, and they call old people dust bunnies. <laughs> and I'm like, you're giving them your attention in time? <laughs> but it's, it's a good, good podcast in a lot of ways. But, you know, we, we think in 20, 30 years, people are going to look back. What idiots we were. 100 years, they're going to look back. And so we understand this. After thousands of years, we are not at the pinnacle of human growth and learning. But the word of God remains true. The word of God has the same message that it had 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, that it had to Abraham. It's the same. It hasn't changed. Why? Because it's the word of God. It's the word of God. And God is calling us. He sometimes, sometimes his call involves sacrifices. And they are, God tells us they're always worth it. Sometimes we don't learn they're worth it until we get to heaven. But he tells us he will make good come out of the most evil things that happen on this earth. He will do that. He's the one constant that doesn't change. A Abraham's obedience, it impacted Sarah. And she's also uh, commended for her response. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. Now, this gets to that whole thing. We talk about this a lot. How much faith do I need to have? And this is that important thing. It's not the amount of faith you have. It's what your faith is in. That's what's important. That's what's important. And era, Abraham and, and Sarah may have, may have had ups and downs and, and, and two steps forward, one, you know, that kind of thing. But the point is they still had that faith. They trusted God. They believed God. They acted upon their belief. Sometimes they had misguided actions, but they acted upon their belief. And God said, that's good. In Hebrews 11, he's saying, that's faith. Imitate that faith. It's not great faith sometimes, but it's faith. And the key is not the amount of faith you have. It's what your faith is in. Too many people, their faith is in their ability to take care of themselves and their family. And then tragedies strike and their faith is shattered. It's shattered because they put their faith in the wrong thing. So Abraham and Sarah, they're called out of their culture. They're called out of their family. They're called out of comfortable economic security. They all had to, they had to put their eggs into the right basket because all other baskets have no foundation. If God is your security, then you have security no matter what is going on in the world. If the world is your security, then you have no security no matter how good things are going at this moment. The word of God teaches us that. We gotta be careful what we put our, put our security in. So, Abraham was told to go. The idea that he heard and he obeyed, all right? His faith was willing. His faith was willing to forego. Giving up involves sacrifices. And now I want you to see his faith that is willing is, is willing to live looking forward, to live looking forward. Now, this is that idea of it's not about me that we talked about a little earlier. This is that idea of looking outside of myself because that's what happens when the call of God shakes you. You begin to go, oh, there's more outside of here that's way more important than I realized. There's stuff that I need to deal with that's way more important than I realized. Um, so we're going to go to the next slide. This froze up. Uh, Verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. What does that mean? Abraham lived in light of a new reality. After God called him, or we could say he began to see the whole picture, not just the limited view that we have. He began to think, what is real? It's not just my culture. It's not just my world. It's not just what I can see and hear. There's more than that. We tend to look and this is a problem. We tend to look at Abraham and Sarah through a 21st century lens. Like, like, like when we read Genesis, like that was, that was written recently. We have to understand it, it was written in a style that of those days. And we, we have to understand that we have the advantage of having the whole Bible to interpret things. Abraham and Sarah had nothing. They just had God's call. That's all they had. They had no Bible. They only had what God told them. And so, you know, oftentimes we're quick to criticize. I'm, I've done it. We're quick to criticize Abraham and Sarah. But we have to understand, what were they working with? Very little. They understand a lot of things. 
And so they're doing the best they can as being as faithful as they can with what they know. And we need to see Abraham and Sarah as this, as God showing us like a case study of him bringing the realization of a new reality into some people's lives. See, understand this. It is God bringing the realization of a new reality into the life of Abraham and Sarah and them grappling with it their whole lives, struggling, not understanding, more information, and that whole thing. He's beginning to show them there's more to this world than comfort. There's more to this world than family. There's more to this world than power. There's more to this world than fame. There's more to this world than me. That's what he's showing them. And they are a living, breathing case study for us to learn from. And we have so much more to help us. We have the whole Bible. All this information by God to help us to understand this new reality. They didn't have that. So next time you read about Abraham, think about it in those terms. God is showing them there's a whole new way of living this life. Now, Abraham doesn't know much. He just has a general idea of what God wants to do. He knows God will use his descendants in a great way. In Genesis 15, he gets this inkling that there's going to be some sort of great sacrifice that God is going to make on behalf of the sins of mankind. He gets this inkling because of the, because in Genesis 15. It's just a general idea. And yet, I love this. In John chapter 8, Jesus says to the Pharisees, Abraham rejoiced to see me. He's rejoicing right now to see me. He was looking for me. Imagine how that must have torqued them. You know, that just must have drove them crazy to have him say that. Father Abraham, the father of our religion, is like, oh, it's Jesus in worship. But Abraham, Jesus is what he was looking forward to. All, he didn't understand it totally, but that's what he was looking forward to all the way back in Genesis when God said, get out, when God said, get out and go. He's, uh, and, then he go, and then he travels. Let's uh, go to the next slide. This is Genesis 12, 6 and 7, I hope. Abram, uh, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, this, you know, this, you, you read this, you just go, uh, uh, yeah, okay. No, this is an incredibly powerful statement. Let me explain to you. Abraham did something incredibly significant. Now, it says he traveled to the land of the side of the great tree of Morat Shechem, and that time the Canaanites were in the land. Everybody knows the Canaanites. He's saying that specifically to get them to understand the situation and the setting. And then when he says it's the great tree of Mora at Shechem, that's really hard to translate. Um, it, it's a... Uh, let me just say this. This, this is a, a tree, and it's, it evidently is some kind of a great tree. And it's a type of tree, terebinth they call it, that the Canaanites worshipped. They, ha they held worship at that, that type of a tree, specifically, especially that type of a tree. Um, I read one guy, he was saying a lot of times they'd have these soothsayers that would come, and if you had a question, they'd go, they'd go to a terebinth tree, but especially the great tree at Mora, because it's so much bigger than all the others. And when the wind blew, the leaves would rustle, and if le and it, leaves rustled and leaves fell, they would divine, this is what the gods want you to do. It was a divining spot, right? It was a place where they practiced their cultic religion. They could read the tree. They called it the Elan tree, which is named after this the, uh, uh, one of their highest Canaanite gods. So here's a great tree, a major tree, a major place of worship. And Abraham goes there. Think about this. He goes to one of their major places of worship and he erects an altar to God. He takes a stand. He's witnessing. He's worshiping and he's witnessing. He takes a stand. This is important He's saying to them, I know the God of the universe. This is the God you guys should be worshiping. This is who you should be worshiping. See, he went. He knew there would be sacrifices, and he decided, I'm going to live facing outward. I'm going to live looking at others. I am going to testify to the Lord God Almighty. And so he worships, and worship, let me tell you something, worship is witness. I get this all the time 
We've had people that have come to this church. There may be somebody here now this way. And they go, when I'm here, there's something special happening. And I don't know what it is. You know, I'm always like, uh, God, hello. It's God. But people have said that to me before. Because worship is witness. And he, this is one way. He, and, and what is he doing? He's confronting culture. He's in their face. It says right after that, he went to, the, to a high place in Bethel, which is another place they worship. And he built another altar. I can, can you imagine? He's, Abraham's probably like, you guys are going to get sick of me after a while because I'm going to go everywhere and build these altars to the real God because you guys are all Looney Tunes. You know, he's just giving it to them. Not in an ugly, mean way, not Looney Tune way. That wasn't nice. But he's giving it to them. So for us, God is saying, just like Abram and Sarah, God is saying, get out. That is, follow me. Follow me. When Jesus went to the disciples and said, follow me, what is he doing? He's, it's the call of Abraham. It's that call. He's shaking them. He's saying to Peter and John and James, you think that this life of fishing, you're going to be comfortable? It's going to be fine? You don't know what could happen. What are you doing with your life? Follow me. Follow me. So he tells him, and he tells us, he's saying the same thing to us. He's saying that means if I tell the truth, if I'm loving, if I obey God, I may lose some security in this world. I may lose some money in this world. I may lose some status in this world. I may lose some friends in this world. But we know, we know that Jesus, he lost it all. He lost it willingly. And as a Christian, we know that following God may be hard at times, but it's nothing like the homelessness, the pennilessness, the fatherlessness that Jesus endured on our behalf. Nothing like that. So Jesus endured that so that I can have a real home, a real family, a real security that has foundations. Jesus tells us this so that we can control the myth of security that is rampant in our culture, that we have to make sure we're taken care of. There's nothing wrong, uh, nothing wrong with planning ahead, taking care of. There's nothing wrong with 401Ks. There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But if that's your life, if that's what you live for, you've missed it. You've missed it. So how do we do what Abraham did? He was purposeful. He erected altars in places where the Canaanites worshiped. We need to do that too. How do we do that? Nothing new. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. We do that. Why? How? By being loving, especially to those that we would not normally love. Hard love. Hard love. Sometimes that's to a coworker. Sometimes that's to a neighbor. Sometimes it's your kids. Sometimes it's your parents. Hard love, being loving, being a servant, especially to those who can't reciprocate. That's why I love, one of the things I love so much is our ministry to the homeless where they can never pay us back. They can never pay us back. Being serving, being people of integrity, even when it hurts us. It's keeping a light touch on this world. Being people of the open hand rather than the closed fist. And it's different for each one of us. That's why I can't tell you exactly what to do. The call of God comes to you. But the call of God is, what are you doing with your life? Are you living for what's important? Is there something greater out there you should be, you should be wrestling with and thinking about? And then as you do that, you wrestle with it, you think about it, you start going, ah, oh, here's something. Here's something. Okay, years ago, I... Uh, I worked at a hotel. I think I told you guys this. I worked at a hotel. I was the doorman of a hotel in Washington, D.C. Now, people go, oh, oh bellman, bellboy, you know, like that kind of stuff, and they make fun. Let me tell you something. I made more money than I've ever made since in my life <laughs> as a doorman of a hotel, a nice hotel, right? And it was interesting. You met all kinds of people. I met all kinds of people. I gave... No, this is too dated, <laughs> but, well, I will. I gave the Beach Boys a personal tour of Washington, D.C., and they sang to me. Yeah, what up, right? <laughs> I'm somebody, <laughs> right? I'm something. Uh, 
just all kinds of things like that. And, and, and I'm working at that hotel. And at the same time, my wife and I were in, in, in a church and, and we were working in a youth group with kids. And at that time, um, our area had a lot, a lot of influx of, of migrants um, because of the Vietnam War and the other stuff of Laotians and Thais and, and Vietnamese. And we had this huge outreach. And these Bev and I, you know, we, we rented this, got married, we rented this apartment, and these kids would come over, the, these Laotian kids and, and, and Thai kids would just come over all the time, and they had no money, they were dirt poor, and so like if we do a retreat, we'd pay for a bunch, we'd pay for their, because I got money, yo, and it's cash every day, it's like I felt like I was the richest man in the world, and, um, and so we would, we would do that, and, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I just said, I want, to, I want to spend more time with these kids. I want to do more with these teenagers than I want to go to work. And I said, how can I do that? How can I do that? And we packed up and we moved and I, and I, and I got my master's degree and came to Newport News, Virginia and started working with teenagers, and some of them are here. <laughs> you don't recognize them as teenagers, do you? That was 40 years ago. But because God shook me, all of a sudden I said, what am I doing? Now look, that doesn't mean you leave your job and you pack, pack up and go somewhere and get a different degree and then become involved. It's not, it's not what it's about. It's about understanding what God wants you to do and being saying, I'm willing to do it no matter how much it costs. Just, I'll just, I'm just willing to do it. I'm willing to do it. That's what God wants for us. Can I tell you, I said this last week, God is no robber of joy. He is no robber of joy. You will find the process of living for Jesus Christ is one of the most fulfilling, exciting, scary, sometimes so scary. But it's, there's no other way to live. It is the best. To be able to do things that will matter for eternity People can put their names on buildings, and people can, can erect monuments. But we, we put the name of God on people's hearts for eternity. There's no greater life. Don't settle for second best. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Abraham and Sarah. Forgive us for the maybe the times we said things about them that were hasty and judge them. But Lord, we thank you that through failures and successes and triumphs, whatever it was, they kept their faith. They believed in you and they obeyed. And in doing that, he reaped great joy when a thousand years later, he saw Jesus, one of his sons, the savior of the world. Lord, you have that joy for us. So help us to run to it, to grab it, to never let it go. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.